And now, your feature presentation. Welcome back to another Untitled Movie Review. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside, he's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Matt, the sleeper has awakened. Yes, it has. It is day four? Of the I think Toronto so. International Film Festival. Um, it's bright and early. Eric and I got uh, a full night's sleep last night. Hurrah! <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, sort of. <clears throat> but uh, yes, today we are reviewing one of our most anticipated films uh, of the festival, Denny Villeneuve's Dune. Uh, probably one of our most anticipated movies of the year. It, it, I think for the last two years as well, it was on our most anticipated list. Um, Eric, I know you were a big fan of the the novel in high school. Uh, we both you've seen the David Lynch version. Uh, I sure people, have. People have told me to avoid it because I might as well just watch this one. Now I'm I'm second guessing that. Um, but I can't wait to talk to you about this because uh, we got some spicy takes again, Eric. We got some spicy. Takes. Matt, we are going to be the mind killers uh, of the Dune discourse, uh, if you will. And thinking about like, as you mentioned, we even did a Dune preview, preview. a prune, if you will. Uh, we saw Dune at noon, in the but summer. then also did a prune earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. And we were really excited with. The footage what that we, we saw. saw that that highlighted, you know, the the world building and, and the scope and, and Hans Zimmer's score. Um, and then we watched the movie at Scotiabank Theater in Toronto, uh, as you mentioned, Dune at Noon. Um, and probably the best way to experience it, with the exception of maybe watching it at Cinesphere. Um, although in retrospect, thinking about how uncomfortable those, those seats, seats are, are at Cinesphere, <clears throat> uh, being a movie that's 155 minutes long, um, probably a good thing that we did see it at uh, Scotiabank Theater. Um, I, I honestly, like, because the screens are pretty comparable. Like, um, I think they're almost identical in size. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe Cinesphere is a little bit bigger. And I don't think they were showing it on film at Cinesphere. I think it was still a digital, like, laser IMAX projection. but. Either way, yeah, we did see it as uh, Denny intended, which is in IMAX, which I feel like, you know, when we're getting into the positive spoilers, Eric and I were, it's probably my biggest disappointment of the year and in quite some time, because uh, again, it pains me to say this, because I, I don't think anyone would consider Eric and I, you know, of the contrarian mindset where we just want to take down Dune because it's this giant movie that people seem very excited for because like we were those people. I was And we so, love Denny Velno. Yes, I have loved, you know, I went to the at speaking of Tiff, I went to the retrospective and saw a lot of his French language stuff because I was only kind of familiar with his English language stuff before that. Um, and I've loved basically everything I have seen from this man. All of his English language stuff from Enemy, uh, even Prisoners to then Sicario, I love Blade Runner, uh, Arrival. And like, uh, I love this dude. He's one of my favorite working directors. I think he's that guy who kind of came into the, the Hollywood kind of system and, you know, learned from people like Nolan and other people like that. And oh, Ridley Scott his, as well. Ridley Scott as well, when you think of Arrival and different things like that, too. And just in his cinematography and how his movies look. But um, I just feel like and then he kind of took the best things of those guys and then made his own kind of, uh, you know, uh, look and feel and just has completely crushed it. So when Dune was announced and we saw this footage, so, so excited. Uh, the cast is incredible when you looked at kind of, um, you know, just the the score, what we talked about, everything. I was just so pumped for this movie. I thought it was going to be great. Uh, and what and, happened? <laughs> and unfortunately, like I was like uh, beyond myself afterwards uh, of just being like, I can't believe how disappointed I am in this. And like, I don't want to all just lean on that and say like my expectations came into play and different things. So I do think the movie has some legitimately huge issues from its story, from the look of it uh, to, you know, how it's characters. And like, I just think it's, it's riddled with issues and I just feel like it is an utterly incomplete movie. And then that's my biggest problem, but let's get into it, Eric. Um, thank you all uh, for tuning in. This is going to be a big one, but we're covering the entirety of the Toronto international film festival. So 
over on our YouTube channel, Untitled, you can get all of our reviews in a video form, or if you prefer an audio form, you can head over, if you're on the go or something like that, you can um, head over to Untitled Movie Reviews on podcast services, and you can get all of our TIFF coverage there. Uh, we have tons of reviews out right now. I'm already blanking, but uh, Spencer, Last Night in Soho, some big ones, as well as some smaller stuff as well. So it'll just all be individual reviews over on those two channels. So uh, if you're over on YouTube, subscribe, hit that notification bell, drop a like if you uh, agree with us or disagree with us and just like hearing our perspective, because uh, that's OK, too. <laughs> on this one uh, might be the case. But Eric, let's kick it off. So like- I think I, I want to say something uh, for before we, we normally give a plot synopsis. I usually give an incoherent yeah. rambling of what the movie. No, is you do about. a very good job each time. But Way better I than I could ever do. feel we should kind of skip that and talk about sort of sure. plot points that we found worked or obviously didn't work because if you're no familiar spoilers, with the, yes no no just, spoilers yeah. although it is very faithful to frank herbert's uh first novel and again denny Villeneuve, as you mentioned is a filmmaker that we both admire greatly if you haven't seen uh you know his Quebecois movies like Polytechnique. You should go back and see or them, Mailstorm yeah. or even you know the film that kind of gave him a a, a a a launching pad internationally speaking with Ensemble's and um, he's just one of those guys who visually comes from the same cloth cut of the. Uh, you know, cut of cloth as, as Ridley Scott, where like, you know, his visual aesthetic is the thing that people really remember him for or know him for. And, you know, you, you look at the style of his filmmaking, it's very commercial, it's very slick, but it also has this kind of weird, almost kind of godlike quality to his filmmaking, where you see the religious iconography of the world sort of being interwoven within his films. And that kind of lends itself also perfectly to Doom, Doom where you have these, you know, different factions and groups, um, you know, whether they be the Harkonnen or House of Atreides or the Ferriman and sort of like, you know, looking at it from the analogous point of view of okay this is you know uh muslim culture christian culture and everything in between all fighting for what essentially you know spice is basically oil in the middle east yeah. and you know colonialism and, and feudalism and sort of the idea of who owns what and 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 who should own what um and so a lot of that lends itself to an ambitious canvas but frank herbert's dune is such an unwieldy book to begin with that when you look back and and see like you know this this is this is a property that has been attempted to be made over the decades you know obviously the dino de laurentis produced david lynch directed dune was a complete and utter failure and it was also kind of made after the fragments of what Alejandro Jodorowsky's Dune was going to be kind of fell apart. And then a lot of the people that worked on that film uh, went on to work on Ridley Scott's Alien. Ridley Scott also wanted to direct Dune uh, right before he directed Blade Runner, but it also fell apart at that time then, because, yeah. So it yeah. all comes full circle in this weird yeah. cyclical kind of way, but it also kind of goes to show you that, and and then obviously as well with a lot of the sci-fi miniseries that you know came out in the early 2000s one of which actually had Susan Sarandon uh in it as well and you think to yourself okay well maybe it's just not meant to be um and and i think that the biggest problem with this film is that it essentially feels like an extended prologue you're not really getting a self-contained story that's satisfying yes you're getting the visual majesty of what you would expect from a you get a lot of lore you're getting a lot of kind of things like that but you don't get you know a classic and i'm not even saying it needs to be a classic but um it just needed to have a complete story especially when you're launching what you hope to be a new franchise i know it's not new but it's going to be new to a lot of people for me i've avoided dune for 32 years of my life not intentionally just because i i'm not a big reader and um, and I, the David Lynch version, everyone just said was not so great. So I've kind of avoided it. So this is brand new to me. So to make a movie, what seems like it's a, well, trust us to, you're going to get the whole story, which is not guaranteed, or it's made for the fans of the book because they know what 
they're going to get or what is to come. So you can kind of just show them like, look at all the cool stuff that I'm kind of teasing or, or different things like that. But when you come in uh, fresh and brand new to this world, um, it kind of drops you in and it is dense and gives you a lot of backstory and things like that. And then the movie takes its time over two and a half hours, two and a half plus hours to kind of just give you what Eric mentioned of like, the prologue of like it doesn't really give you a story it, it kind of shows you what the story is going to be over what seems like the next couple movies or a franchise and a potential but, tv series that will bridge certain aspects of uh, other places in the world like the sisterhood specifically but you, you get through two and a half hours and it feels like the movie is just getting started and then ends and it, it's kind of baffling. It almost feels strange to review it, in my opinion, because it feels like if we were going to review episode one of a TV series. It's a grain and, of and, sand in a desert. Ah, what, that's what I we're reviewing. It. And and that's the biggest frustration is like, I, I think it's egregious to have a brand new, you know, $200 million big movie that just feels incomplete. And it even starts with part one. But the thing is, is like, there's no guarantee that this movie is going to do well enough that we're going to get the rest of it. Um, and I think just sitting there, I'm like, okay, I'm not really invested in these characters yet. Um, I, the world is intriguing because I think with the IMAX footage and the scope and the, you know, the cinematography is good. I didn't love like the color palette and the movie just has a lot of browns and some oranges and it's and shot in like Jordan that. specifically. And, and there's a couple of sequences that are shot in Norway as well. And, and it kind of has like your traditional kind of like sci-fi landscape of a barren world. Arrakis is, I mean, as described, you just like a giant. And I desert. get that that's part of it, but then the movie just just feels empty to me where you have you know a lot of industrial looking kind of buildings that are gigantic and i keep going back to the scope which which i think is astonishing at times especially if you see it in a giant imax screen um but then i just felt it was empty and kind of uh drab and and uh, uh and which made it hard to get invested in this world you're giving me cool backstory with the harkins and the emperor and and who was on arrakis before and then the native people to the land and and you know how people are coming in and, and stealing this this resource and and taking over their land and kind of uh and things like that and there's some cool stuff there but over two and a half hours i feel like you know, the movie really focuses on Paul, uh, played by Timothée Chalamet, and like it really is his story. So you're surrounded with all these other people, and I guess Re Rebecca Ferguson too. Like those are the two people I think. Yeah, are Lady the Jessica and, and Paula um, Atreides are the two sort of main characters. Where and they like have the meatiest kind of roles, and the, and you get the most from those two. And I think both of them are are pretty solid. But like then you're surrounded with great actors, like you know Oscar Isaac as his father, uh, uh, Leto or Leto. Um, uh, Duke Leto. Uh, yeah. Uh, you got Josh Brolin, Stellan Skarsgård's kind of the villain as this uh, Baron, and um, Dave Bautista, who's on like three scenes. Um, Zendaya, who is in barely any of this movie. I, I think it's Zendaya, um, though, right? Sure. Um, uh, Zendaya. Um, uh, who but is, she's not Michi in this. No, she is Chani. Um, who I think people are going to go, oh, wow, she's literally in none of this movie right <laughs> she's really just there to set up a sequel again um and then you have all these great charlotte rampling jason momoa javier bardem and like um and each person feels like they only have one or two scenes in the movie and again a movie that's two and a half hours where i feel like what happened in the movie i'm like <laughs> it literally feels like something that could have been condensed in the first 30 to 40 minutes and like there are some big set pieces you know um and, and things like that that can be exciting at times but then i even found like the fight choreography with the the they have all these um it's kind of like a yeah like it's a, like a barrier that goes around them it's a it's a protective shield. and then the fighting i just didn't think was that exciting and then i just kind of sat there kind of emotionless through the whole thing like certain you know characters that you know either uh like I just go, oh, I'm not invested in this person for enough for me to care in this moment about something. You're just kind of relying on, you know, hoping going, well, you see the interpersonal relationships that they have. We've kind of given you a little bit of that. So that should be enough emotion to carry this 
some weight in this scene. And I go, it's not because I don't know these characters enough. Um, or where- there, there's expectations of like, even if you're not familiar with Dune itself, you, you know, you go in knowing other science fiction stories sure. or just like Joseph Campbell's sort of uh, the, the, the journey of the hero, the chosen one, because that's the other thing about this is that, you know, uh, talking about Dune or even, you know, John Carter of Mars, where those stories were major influences and inspirations to people like George Lucas, who took from those yeah. texts and created their own world. So when you get and back you can kind of see how source, hugely influential it is. But weirdly, now that you like, sorry, when you get back to the source the, material and you adapt it, it just kind of feels like, oh, well, you've already seen a version of this that maybe was, again, inspired by that. And it's the source material. It's the it's the it's the the granddaddy of them all. But it kind of loses a little bit of of weight and luster because it's been you know influenced and inspired by other things over the decades and that's Mm -hmm. kind of what both john carter although i think john carter it's been a while since i've watched it i think john carter is a little bit more fun than dune and i think the biggest criticism denny villeneuve's had in in his entire career and i've never really kind of subscribed to that um is that his movies are very cold and clinical um until now (laughs) yeah (laughs) but it's not done in a way that's you know austere and and thought provoking it just it feels like it's, Which I think Blade Runner and Arrival did that. Yes, it's setting up the world, but it's doing so at a sort of minute pace that when you get to the end of the film, you ultimately feel like, what was the point of watching that movie? Because it's all just literally not even set up. It's just kind of just establishing, okay, there's this planet that the house of Atreides have become the stewards to, uh, for the emperor and, forced them to do it. Yeah. And yeah. there's, you know, there's the, the political turmoil between all these other families and communities. Um, and again, it's all sort of referencing actual historical um, sort of world building in, in that way. But, but it, what ultimately it, it, fails on it and 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 again we've talked about this is that it just doesn't seem to be able to tell a fulfilling story within the parameters of 155 minutes david lynch's dune is not good but after having watched denny vel Neuve's dune david lynch's dune one feels more organic and alive and pulsating and it skims through a mm. lot more than just the first book with 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 dune with david lynch's dune but what it does is it it feels a little bit more realized i think my biggest problem with david lynch's dune is that it's just it's very mundane it's just kind of boring for a filmmaker who you know is one of the most interesting and surrealist kind of guys out there and just him as a personality um it was taken away from him and and again like they were trying to make you know another star Mm -hmm. wars movie after you know, Return of the Jedi had kind of played its course. So when you're watching David Lynch's Dune, you're thinking to yourself, okay, it's not really representative of David Lynch's career, but at least it's telling a story from beginning to end and not having this expectation of thinking, okay, we're going to make this a giant franchise. Like it's making a movie from beginning to end, start to finish, and it tells a full story. This has that expectation of, okay, We're going to spread this out over the course of multiple films, potential series. And yeah, like an obvious comparison that this has been made to is the Lord of the Rings movies. But you look at Fellowship, even within the context of Fellowship, there's stuff in there that I think is emotionally earnest that earns that kind of vulnerability of the characters and the connections that you make over the course of quote unquote, just a walking movie Um, Mm -hmm. where this, you know, none of the characters you really kind of gravitate towards other than just knowing the shorthand of, okay, this is the, you know, weapons master, or this is, you know, uh, the the father, or this is the physician. And then like, even some of the images of, you know, like, the the bull you know kind of reminded me again of blade runner 2049 with you know the wooden horse Mm -hmm. yeah i I mean i totally agree with you and um it'll be like again interesting if parts two or three and four get made because like i could maybe revisit this and and see where you know this where the seeds were planted and i guess like the overarching story is like okay paul paul's journey to the freemans right um uh fremen uh, to the fremen um that's kind of 
the simplest way of portraying this. He's has these visions and he needs to get to these people, even if it's subconsciously. Um, and that's kind of the simple story of the movie. But then that to me, isn't enough. Like it's, you've planted all these things and you set up all this stuff that it just kind of feels like, okay, it feels like the first act of a movie. And it's just, uh, I, I just, I'm baffled by it, but to go, um, into some positives, I will say Hans Zimmer's score is working real hard and it is great. Like it's a, a lot of, you know, like chanting and, and not choir per se, but um, like, well, it uh, is choral. Like, I, I mean, there yeah. is, there is, you so know, chorus female voices yeah. when, you know, you have the sisterhood or Lady Jessica sort of oh, front and center. Of like, oh, yeah. like it's, it's, it's a lot of world music where they're like, I mean, even to the point where there's bagpipes in one scene. Oh, yeah. I almost thought was kind of cool. comical. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. And I do think that the IMAX cinematography, as much as I, I really kind of was, uh, turned off by like the brown and, and kind of lifeless look of, of, of the movie, the IMAX footage, like I understand why they're like, oh, you need to go see this in a theater. Cause I just don't, if we were this disappointed seeing it in the best way possible, like, I feel like if I'm watching this on my TV on HBO max, like I'm just kind of. I'm like, uh, like the footage wouldn't even be that impressive, right? Where at least like when you're in this massive screen and it takes that that almost four by three giant lengthy aspect ratio in, in the IMAX theater where you just see the massive scope of these buildings and ships and things like that. Like at times it is, like I said, astonishing where you're like, oh, this is and we've seen it, you know, in Nolan stuff and and other people who have, have heavily used IMAX. But um I just uh, I love the IMAX format. And so when a good chunk of the movie is in that, I'm like, oh, this stuff is impressive at times, even though it does have that thing that, you know, people get annoyed with even in, in again, Nolan stuff where it goes from two, four, nine to the big IMAX aspect ratio. And sometimes when you intercut between a scene that has like half of it in two, four or two, three, nine and half of it in IMAX, it becomes like jarring. I don't know if you felt the same way, but yeah, IMAX a little bit, is... but, but when you, when you're watching kind of that full frame, that kind of completely encapsulates the screen, I think sometimes it's interesting to see like where certain, like say characters are within the frame, especially when you have, you know, scenes of action, there are some really nicely choreographed action set pieces where like there's one that I think it, it, there's not a lot of it, but there's kind of like a fight between, you know, the, the house of Atreides guards versus this sort of um, elite group of killers that are hired by the, uh, uh, the Harkonnens that are that it's almost like you're looking at like British warfare where like, you know, the classic kind of style of standing in one position, um, firing the weapon and then standing down and letting the next one come back. And it's all done on like on a staircase, which very mm -hmm. much feels like it is referencing also Battleship Potemka uh, mm -hmm. a little bit as well. And I think those moments um, are good, but they're fleeting throughout. And, it, and again, it's the same thing with, with the cast where like you look at like you know, Javier Bardem and Josh Brolin in a scene together, you know, since No Country for Old Men. And it's kind of like, what a waste, you know, like having these two amazing actors. The only scene that they share, really, they're only both in very little of the movie. I'm trying to like. Yeah, mo 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 mostly everybody is. And again, like mm -hmm. it is almost to the point of it being distracting where, again, David Lynch is doing in, in retrospect you know, like you can look at a lot of the cast members that are in, you know, that movie and say like, oh yeah, these are, these are name actors in the sense of like, okay, they've worked a lot with David Lynch, whether it be, you know, Brad Dora or, you know, Kyle McLaughlin, but they were either um, up and coming actors or in their first film. I mean, Kyle McLaughlin mm -hmm. Dune was his first movie, you know, and, and he was lucky that, that David really took a shine to him because I think if, you know, it was anybody else or if, if the director didn't really want to work with him again, that that's a movie that that's a career killer, especially mm -hmm. if it's your first film. Yeah. Um, and, and so luckily they did blue velvet afterwards and, you know, history was made there with, in terms of, you know, great, creating a great subversive sort of um, neighborhood murder mystery, but um, to, to, you know, oversimplify that one, but it just kind of feels to me like everybody in this movie 
is chosen for their roles for the most part not everybody there are some really wonderful character actors kind of spread out but it just almost feels like okay we need these big names in order to make the movie because you know we're we're selling this weird cult sci-fi novel that kind of lonely weird kids in high school read the book i'm specifically talking about myself <laughs> with, with that case but it's not it's not mainstream like star wars or even star trek it's it's such a fringe thing that you need you know timothy chalamet and you need um you know people like that to kind of in zendaya to really sell the film because it's not going to be it's not going to be a commercial hit otherwise. Like if you get like the best actor for those roles, mm -hmm. it, it might still not sell. So they're kind of trying to hedge their bets with like, okay, who's really hot right now and in the moment. And I don't even think anyone's like bad or miscast or anything. It's just almost that I just, but it's just really so just distracting. Like, yeah. Right. Where like, I think if you got mm -hmm. actors that maybe were unknown and you didn't have this preconceived notion of who they are or what they've done previously, um, you might be more invested in the world or at least be able to suspend some disbelief when it comes to looking at who these characters are. Because mm -hmm. again, you know, there's, you don't really come away being like, mm -hmm. you know, Paul Atreides is, you know, the Luke Skywalker of, you know, or the Frodo of this world. Like he's such a memorable character. You, you, you basically say, Oh, Timothy Chalamet, you know, um, got an Oscar nomination a few years ago for call me by your name and is now kind of cashing in those <laughs> chips and being in this big studio project that costs $200 million to make. And it is kind of almost comical that, you know, a cult, you know, sensation has a $200 million budget. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just bizarre. We talked about this even a little bit with like the suicide squad being a film that it's like, you know, it's a trauma movie, but with a hundred million dollar budget. And it's kind of very similar where the studio is taking mm -hmm. this giant risk because, you know, Denny has done so well, even though blade runner 2049 was also a commercial misfire, but a very good movie. And I think that if you really want to see something that is, you know, representative of his entire career up until now, that's the film you go back and watch. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I totally agree. And I, I saw someone tweet this out being like, they almost applaud him for playing chicken with studio money with this movie because right. it's, it's like, I, I totally get that. Where he's like, I'm doing it and I'm banking. I'm that doing you're gonna make, And I'm banking that you're going to let me make more of them because uh, I'm like, uh, God bless you, dude. Because like, I, again, I love the guy and I, I think that, you know, he is one of the best working directors in Hollywood. And I, again, I, I was so pumped for this and I'll always still be excited. I'll be excited for more Dune movies if they get made, because again, I, I was, when we were walking home from this movie, I'm like, I didn't like it. I was really disappointed. And I thought there was a ton of problems as this, as a singular film, but I will be mad if they, if I don't get more <laughs> because I, 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 I feel You've like I already invested too much yeah right? I, I feel like i got just part of that story and i want to revisit this movie you know uh, 10 years down the line and go okay we got dunes part one two and three and now i can look at it as a complete story and maybe i like it more in retrospect because it's yeah maybe not a ton happens but i can see how they set up different plot points or characters and things like that but as someone who literally is brand new to this they didn't do enough to get me like invested in this world like it even feels weirdly like the scope is gigantic but then the movie takes place mostly on arrakis and you get a little bit from the heart is it harkins the harkonnens harkonnens uh, yeah the harkonnens and and their kind of faction that involves dave bautista and stellan skarsgård and i like the design of him and you said he's more gross in the novel right but he's like, yeah he's more like, he there's he's more pulsating yeah and <laughs> i like i do wish least. it was kind of grosser or weirder too but like it does have some weird stuff that i think is cool that like you said eric like you can tell that this novel it has inspired so many different you know creators or stories like it a lot of this reminded me of Hideo Kojima I've talked about on our last draft um I was uh re-watching kind of the Metal Gear games in in a kind of a movie format on YouTube and I I wouldn't be surprised if Kojima is a huge fan of Dune because it does a cool thing where it kind of takes that militaristic kind of um you know uh political kind of vibe and meshes that with sci-fi and i think that's really really cool and that's what kojima does in all of the metal gear games and you talked about that one fight 
on Arrakis on the staircase where they bring these kind of uh, assassins down. And those reminded me like Raiden or Raiden from Metal Gear Solid 2, like with the sword and the silver or the grayish kind of suit or, or cyborg ninja and stuff like that in Metal Gear. Like you can really tell that people like this is a hugely influential story and um And that kind of is, yes, that's cool that we're finally seeing a fully realized kind of big budget version of this, Um, but not even fully realized. I I back, uh, I'll backtrack that on right away, like maybe from a visual standpoint and and stuff like that. But again, um, I, I just, I keep going back to, I feel like it's incomplete. Like I can't even tell you what the full, you know, what the story of this movie was other than setting up future movies. And, well, um, you already summed it up. You know, it's it's Paul Atreides looking for the ferryman, yeah. and, and and that's, and that's kind of it. And that is kind of it. And like you, you, I don't get enough from you know the uh, the Harkonnen of, of what their kind of motivations are. Uh, we don't Other than that, they time. kind of ruled uh, Arrakis before <laughs> and were ordered by the emperor to leave. And sort yeah. of again, the spice being this multi billion dollar business. And again, it's looking like at the idea of like the fall of the Roman empire and you know, the, 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 the crashing of civilizations under duress and but basically then, being given a thankless task of making it work or being set up to, you know, take on something that you're going to basically fail. And, and to your point, it's basically seeing, you know, uh, the, the, the forest for the trees situation where like you're, you're not seeing a, a, a grand picture. And even though Denny is very much passionate about this, he's talked about this being a dream project of his, it just kind of feels like maybe he's too close to it or treats it too preciously where like someone like Peter Jackson, who is also obsessed with the Lord of the Rings movies was able to know what to tell in each one of those stories Mm -hmm. and how to tell them. You need a full story that all ultimately connects together when you get the whole thing, but you need each one to kind of feel like it has a beginning, middle and end where I feel like, this is the beginning. We're going to get the middle and then there should be an end, right? It's not even the beginning. Like we keep saying, it's the prologue to the beginning. Yeah. It's the and, start of And I, it could Dune. even be a little bit, I could be more forgiving if we spent a little bit more time. Like we had enough time in this movie to go, okay, Paul's journey in this is pretty simple. We've already kind of explained that. So, but we weirdly spend the entirety of the movie with him where we get little snippets of the Harkonnen. We get little uh, snippets of the 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 uh the fremen mostly through paul's visions and things like that where we don't actually spend enough time we get it through exposition through jason jason momoa's character um duncan idaho duncan idaho <laughs> stupid name um i but, mean just me basically like naming your character toronto ontario <laughs> yeah it's just weird um and you don't spend enough time with them so even their kind of plight throughout the movie uh, is just kind of told that we should care and it doesn't do enough to make me like it, it relies on you know the real life kind of things that it's kind of alluding to for you to kind of feel bad for them and and i don't think it does enough to kind of other than they're living underground on arrakis and people have kind of taken their planet from them and um, yeah it's 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 again looking at like indigenous cultures that's what i mean christopher columbus and people like that and absolutely but i need to care about these people in the movie like you can't rely on what it's a metaphor for for me to go well yeah i know what they're trying to say here so i should really care i'm like i still really need to care about i i get that that's a big enough thing people should not be coming into your land and taking it and taking your resources and forcing you underground that's right. awful but like i still needed to know more about javier bardem and and zendaya and and uh i just i you don't spend enough time with any of the characters and then when it comes to the villain and the people you're supposed to be cheering against you uh again much like star wars you don't necessarily see the emperor in the first movie and that's totally fine oh and the um, emperor in david lynch's dune you do see oh, and yeah. it is amazing oh yeah it, he's okay. a giant like <clears throat> creature in a glass tube that is just like it that sounds cool and you yeah. talk about the weirdness of it there you talked about the spider boy that's in this and yeah like, enemy uh, junior as yeah, I call enemy him junior now. yeah and like i dude i had a huge smile on my face in that scene because i wanted more of that right like i think the costumes are cool and the design of all the people 
um, of the different factions. And we talked about this in our preview because uh, I think that was something that impressed us there too. Like I really do think the costume design and we talked about, you know, the people who look like Raiden from Metal Gear and, and the different people like all look really, really It's cool. all tactile um, as well. And I like the idea that they do. I mean, this is one thing that I do kind of like with the script where they explain where like, you know, the, the suits of the Fernan where are tactile but they also have a practical kind of uh, recycling water yeah and that so i think is actually kind planet. of interesting that's some cool world building stuff yeah. right like when people are outside you're like this planet is fucking hot you gotta have the suit on and things like that like that's cool little nuggets of world building and they have that in the character design and the costume design and then but i did want more like creatures or weird and i don't know if that's a thing in dune there really, is no there like, are they're old oh, trust me when you get to dune messiah oh yeah. boy and that's what really we see weird. that spider thing and i was like that's fucking awesome give it's me actually more, of that. more and that like, thing is more creepy and effective than the sandworms yeah. i think the sandworms yeah. in this are overly designed yeah. um and and i think that even Still though again like a giant butthole <laughs> i i would put well no it's it it, it, it it would be amazing to have like a game show where it's sandworm or sarlacc pit yeah you know you show a photo like... of like it's, again going back mm-hmm. to like those references but you think of like you know, the sandworm with like their teeth and also that, you know, the teeth are used as a blade for the fairman and, and, and and then like, you think, okay, like that's kind of cool, but it just, it looks overly produced where David Lynch's Dune, it adds kind of this novelty to it because it's stop motion animation and it kind of looks closer to almost like, you know, the Beetlejuice sandworm. And I, I still think like, again, the best sandworm in in film history at at this point is, is in Tremors. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. The Graboids. Um, again, going back to the scope, like I, I like the scope of the sandworms in those sequences, how how fucking gigantic they are. But I, I, I agree but it's almost like you. they're too big um, because it's almost like you kind of want like, you know, the threat of them is still there, but it's almost just it's it's almost like the Meg where, the, you know, if, if you have a shark that's about like 25 feet long, it becomes a threat to a person's body physically where like it just feels like it you know this thing just gulps you up and it's not really that interesting overall Mm -hmm. where like again the graboids kind of like pull you in and you see what they can do and even the overarching arcing story of the spice and why everyone needs it and 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 why it's so important i feel like they didn't even give me enough of that of why i should care that this is the most valuable thing in the universe they talk about how it is a mcguffin yeah they talk about how it's used for you know um uh interstellar travel and it, it's necessary for that it's how kind of and it's know, also a, a a hallucinogen yeah um, and, which and, enhances kind of paul's abilities and stuff you can kind of get throughout the movie and and that's something we uh, haven't talked about is that yeah. he he himself the character you would think that there would be this really interesting sort of dramatic sort of conflict I- internally from him where like you know he's both his father and his mother's son his father being you know this great leader who again, is also following him in, in his grandfather's footsteps and sort of keeping that bloodline going. But then also on his mother's side, who, you know, has a this telekinetic kind of telekinesis and mind control. And you look at that and think like, okay, well, he is more ashamed of his mother's side and how he has to kind of work more with her throughout the film. And, and there's moments where, you know, he is very revealing of how he feels about that side of the family. And I think Mm -hmm. that like in a, in a better performance and maybe a better movie that would focus on that even more, you could get something that is actually really interesting. But then that is what the movie tries to focus on the most, I think, which is what hinders the other characters is like, but it also fails because it doesn't feel like it really lives up to (laughs) anything. There's just so much going on. Right. And then to focus on such a singular thing is like Paul's very simple journey of just trust us. He needs to get here and, and trust us through his visions that this is what he's supposed to do. And, and trust us, you'll get more from this story where we will fully realize these, these seeds that we've planted. I'm just like, I don't know. Like if it, it's if it's movie two or three, I still think I'm I'm disappointed in this. But I go, OK, well, it's leading into the climax or whatever. Like say in, you know, a classic time where a movie gets split into two where we're like, oh, OK, you know, Deathly Hallows part one 
I, I don't really love because it feels like it's all set up for Deathly Hallows Part 2. But I like Deathly Hallows Part 2 a lot, which then made me like Part 1 more. So, but that's like, also I've, different, though. I, I got to say with that, because the Harry Potter fan franchise was already that's what I mean, established though. at that, that point. But I, Dune, this I'm is making the first that point. Part, yes, right? and Eric, that's my point. So yeah. like you're totally on the same page as me, where I feel like, not necessarily this movie exactly, but I feel like just the way that this movie is presented to us, that's kind of what I mean. Of like, yeah. If it was... You know, they're presenting this as like, a, well, you're going to get more and you, and you but for it being a brand new thing, which I will come full circle and we'll wrap up the review. It's just like, sure, you've read it, Eric. You kind of see where they're going. And it even it frustrated you. And I think oh, people who hella are, heard frustrated die hard Dune fans might be like, well, this is exactly what I want. I know exactly where we're going. And like, I get def- the first tease. It's that first Lord of the Rings movie, like you mentioned, Eric. But like, I, I just don't think that that's, I don't know, the proper way to introduce uh, um, a-, a brand new thing to most audiences. And it just completely falls flat for me. Um, I really do think it's one of my biggest disappoints- disappointments of the year. It kind of relies very heavily on the visuals and that IMAX footage and kind of, um, just hoping that you're kind of taken into this world and engulfed in it because of that stuff where I feel like everything else is pretty thin and relying on, well, we'll probably give you more uh, later. And I can see why Warner Brothers is working really, really hard to make this successful because I feel like, um, you know, it, it, it really relies on getting more of it. And um, I don't know. Like, I just think the cast is wasted. Um, I think it's kind of ugly throughout the action sequences. Like you mentioned, Eric, there are a a couple cool ones that really with the scope of that IMAX footage look pretty astonishing. But even then when it came to the hand to hand combat, which there's a lot of, I found it kind of like, especially right after seeing Shang-Chi and I'm not saying it should be the same style of fighting or anything like that. I just feel like that fighting is so kinetic and, and so much fun. And I'm not saying this movie needs to be fun, but the action was fun to watch where I think everything in this movie is kind of drab and empty. And um, there was nothing that made me go, I want more of this world uh, other than like, okay, there's a couple things that are kind of cool that I want to know more about, but I wish I knew more about them in this movie rather than going, am I going to get a new one in three, four years? <laughs> like is, is Denny going to go right into Dune part two if they're okay? Like it, it's uh, how they didn't shoot one and two back to back when you're kind of, you even start with Dune part one on the title card is just, I can't, I don't know, man. Yeah, well, the way that, like, again, you look at, like, how franchises work now, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a time where, you know, it was like, okay, let's see how it does. But even in the 70s, they shot, you know, Superman 1 and 2 back to back, basically. Yet Now, yes, they, they, they brought in, you know, Richard Lester uh, to replace uh, Richard Donner because, you know, the Salkines and, and, and uh, Richard Donner fought but they kind of knew that they were making two movies literally back to back and then like with the lord of the rings films peter jackson was able to you know basically sort of divide them in a way that was financially uh viable and that's why new line ultimately greenlit all three of the films because he knew where to you know um sort of divide well obviously the books but also just know you know where to rein in budget and things like that and and keep it going and then obviously with franchises in general, the way that they are, you know, you kind of have to think like, okay, if I'm writing this story now, I have to also have a kind of a map to what two, three and whatever, how many of the, these are going to be. I just kind of felt like this was kind of rude in its in, in terms of like its expectations of what it, it it's demanding of its audience. Um, and it weirdly also, you mentioned Harry Potter. It also weirdly reminded me of the fast and furious movies because you have a series, you have a series where it's like, if you've committed to it for so long, it like a lot of people will say that part five is where that series starts to actually become interesting or at Mm -hmm. least fun, but it's almost like you, you commit to everything else that you've seen before, but you know, one to four, because you know, in again retrospective that these movies will get better you know you're committing to dune thinking like okay if we do get a part two maybe going back i'll appreciate dune a little bit more but looking at this as it is as a standalone movie that is telling a story 
it fails. It's it very thin, completely yeah. fails. And if you were to have told me a year and a half ago that I would give Paw Patrol the movie a higher review than this, I I tell you you were crazy because yeah. I look at this and then like also you know Denny Villeneuve has gotten this kind of partly a bad rap but also you know like this kind of fanboy wattage that nolan has as well and, and that's what of, i mean like i feel like he's kind of taken that a little bit from nolan uh, right in recent years but yeah. thinking that both tenant and dune these giant warner brother films Sci-fi directed by movies, a, a yeah. tour filmmaker max footage <laughs> have both completely disappointed us because i think like we were a little yeah. bit underwhelmed by both of them and then like even someone like you know, Leos Carax, who normally I love his movies to death. And then and watching a net, I was excited just like, for Annette, yeah. what's happening, Matt? What's happening? <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, I, I'm totally with you. Um, I will revisit this movie if a part two um, is going to be made and is getting made. And I'm hoping that, you know, I know even from the beginning, we understand because I know some people might watch this and go, Oh, their expectations. Like we knew it was only going to be half of the novel or, or whatever we got of the novel. Like I understand that I get that this was only part of the overall novel, but you needed to still look at that novel and go, okay, where's a good point to end that still gives people a complete kind of still beginning, middle and end that feels satisfying. As and that's representative movie. of what because Frank Herbert's Dune is. If you wanted to do this, then make it a TV series. That's what TV is for is like, Oh, we need longer form storytelling. We, it, it, we can't fit this story into one movie. So let's make it a TV show because we have a little bit more time to spend with these characters and make you care about them. And just that way I can wait week to week or get like the full story in, in 10 hours or 12 hours, whatever you need need and then wait for season two because i still got a full arc where this to me feels like season one episode one of a television show that is setting up a story and now that's it and like yeah yeah, sure there's some cool visuals there's you know uh, some creepy kind of design and stuff some cool uh, costume design scores great um there is some cool stuff in there um, but it really like I feel like I'm I'm reviewing an incomplete movie, and I think that's its biggest problem. So, and just um, from from your point of view, having not re- did, did you feel that you understood what Dune represented as a whole in terms I of think just this like is what the stuff is? we talked about of of you know this this boy who has these special abilities that are um and he is forced from you know his family and the the government to go to this planet and take you know, a resource and land away from, you know, the native people to that land. And he feels this duty to that. He needs to save these people from this draconian, uh, like government system (laughs) and, and these people taking over his land and that this spice thing is hugely valuable to them and, and to the universe, but he just needs to protect this land. That's what I got from it. And I'm sure it's way more complex and like, I want it to be way more complex and, and know all the different houses and what their motivations are other than it's just all about the spice. But like, um, I, I feel like I kind of got the idea, but I don't know if I'm that intrigued in what I just presented you as like something that's going to like, again, I hope that there's more to that. And then you get this whole other side of, you know, from his mother's side who are, you know, this kind of religious witches kind of thing where I'm like, I don't know what they're trying to go for. They're trying to find like this chosen one to save the universe or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, um, so he's I, basically uh, Neo. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, well, any here we talked about many different yeah. movies and things that are the I'm Joseph sure, Campbell thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I think I get it. And I, I again, I want to see more. So if that sounds um like I'm contradicting everything I said in this review. Um, so be it. But like, I think it's because it does feel incomplete that I will be even more mad about this movie if I don't get more. And I'm hoping if I get more, I go back and go, all right, I don't love this as a singular movie, but I like this as a piece of the puzzle. But I, if you gave me a, a quarter of a puzzle and said, oh, are you having fun making that puzzle? I'm going to go, no, I'm not. I don't have three quarters of the pieces. I don't know where the hell these go. Or, or like, tell me what I'm, what, what, what the image is going to be. Yeah. Like, and even then it's like, oh, piece. well, like, and then I explain to you what I think it's about. And well, like, we're not going to tell you, but like, here's, you can probably get it from, you know, that quarter of the puzzle. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can kind of see that we're starting to build this, but like, 
when I'm done that quarter of the puzzle, I'm going to have an empty thing in front of me and I'm just going to have to wait until you give me the other pieces in three years. It's like, no, if you gave me a, a puzzle that was a full puzzle and then you're like, whoa, but that whole puzzle you can then connect to these other puzzles and it's going to be even cooler. And then I go, Oh, that's cool. But to me, this really feels like you dumped a thousand uh, piece puzzle and gave me 250 of them. And I'm right. like, and I just, I, I know guys we've, we've hammered down that point for 50 minutes. So I'll shut up. But um, I do think that there's some cool stuff in here and I really do hope you like it. But um, unfortunately just did not, work for me and uh i'm gonna give it a two out of five <laughs> yeah and and i'm one of those people again you know i've been very critical of this and even david lynch's dune but i have also bought david lynch's dune on every medium since vhs so like you I'm know sure i just buy re- I, I just recently bought the the arrow box set of dune of on 4k, 4K yeah. and this is a movie that i do not like and i'm still force feeding this thing you know, in yeah. every format that it's available on. So, you know, I'm always going to be optimistic that maybe one day they'll crack the code, but it almost just again feels like Frank Herbert's Dune is best as a series of novels and maybe to stay with Frank Herbert's Dune and not go on the path that his son continued because I feel that, uh, you know, it's a little bit uh, uh, diluted when you get to that stuff. Um, so I'm also going to give it a two out of five. Mm hmm it sucks we hate doing this i hate it i hate it i don't even hate the movie it's just i i I hate how um it didn't kind of we're just trying to be honest and how we felt about the film and how we're looking at it Mm -hmm. from a critical point of view we take no pleasure in this i i promise you um thank you all for listening um really curious to see what you guys think of dune um i know it's been getting reactions all over the map i think there are people who are in uh, the same kind of uh, boat as us, but um, I know some people really do like it. So, um, which is great, which is why I love the movies. So uh, I can't wait to hear some other people's perspectives too, and tweet us what you guys think and, and stuff like that. But uh, if you want to get all of our TIFF coverage, uh, you can get it right here on YouTube on the Untitled YouTube channel. Hit subscribe, notification bell, thumbs up, all that jazz, and you'll get all of our reviews uh, throughout the fest. Or head over to Untitled Movie Reviews on podcast services if you prefer an audio format. Uh, prefer an audio format and if you just want a one-stop shop for everything that we're doing head over to our letterboxd hq it's untitled underscore movies you'll get links to all of our social channels you'll get all of our uh, star ratings as well as the links to the podcast and the youtube version the youtube videos are posted there um our personal profiles if you kind of want to see what else we've been watching or kind of want to spoil what we'll be reviewing soon um but thank you so much for listening and 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 watching. We really, really do appreciate it. Uh, you can follow me on all those social medias at Matt Rohrbeck. And I'm Eric Marchin. You can find more of my video reviews at rogerstv.com slash cinemascene, uh, which uh, uh, the latest episode of Cinemascene is now broadcasting now. and will mm-hmm. be available to stream shortly uh, with Matt and I talking about our most anticipated TIFF titles, one of which is Dune. So <laughs> it's now dated. Uh, but but uh, if you want to watch that, I'll be posting it on Monday. So, you know check that out and then also uh you can find me on the social medias uh everything from letterbox to instagram and twitter at em6211 until next time that was one spicy meatball